Greetings. So, what I'm going to be talking about is the neurobiology of um, instrumental violence, or in particular, what I'm going to be talking about is the neurobiological factors that increase the risk that an, an individual will engage in instrumental violence. Now, instrumental violence is goal-directed aggression. So it's the person that puts a gun in your face and asks you for your wallet. That person is engaged in goal-directed behavior. The goal is to get your wallet, and they're using aggression in order to achieve that goal. Now, it's very important to remember here that there's no difference between, at a, at a neurobiological level, fundamentally, between an individual using, uh, pointing a gun in your face in order to get your wallet and an individual going to an ATM and pressing out the code in order to get money out that way. These are both instrumental uh, behaviors, both types of behaviors to achieve a goal. The really critical thing is the decision making that goes in that makes uh, one type of behavior more easy to select than for some individuals than another. And just to illustrate, just to illustrate what it really means, it's very critical to remember there is nothing necessarily atypical about committing antisocial behavior. If I told you that if you could get this button out of, or this machine thing, out of this building, I would give you $100 million. All of you, at least if you were unwise enough to believe what I just said, but all of you <laughs> should be thinking how to get this machine out of the room. If you're not doing that calculation, if you really believe the situation it was really true, if you were not doing that calculation, there would be something wrong with you. You'd be making a fundamental error in decision making. The benefits, $100 million, are so huge, and the costs, sorry, it'd be a bit embarrassing if you got caught on the way out, but the costs are so trivial that you really should be deciding to do that antisocial behavior. On the other hand, if I said to get your $100 million, you have to scoop my eye out with a plastic fork, none of you are rushing over to the cutlery. It's just too horrible that emotional impact of the damage you do to me, my screaming, the thoughts about family members, it's just too unpleasant an idea to actually um, contemplate. I seem to have dropped to five and a half minutes. Is that right? So, um, 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 so uh, anyway, the, um, I'm so distracted, but I'm sure last time I looked it was seven and a half minutes. But um, so um, I think I've had two minutes st stolen from me just for talking about pl plastic forks. Anyway, <laughs> the, really, uh, the, the really critical thing is that it's just, um, um, uh, you know, the, what, when I'm trying to give that illustration, what I'm trying to get you to imagine, it's what it's like for some individuals who are far more capable of making decisions that cause extreme harm to other individuals than other individuals. And what we're really talking about here is individuals with psychopathy. And what we see in an individual with psychopathy, one, one example just of a guy I worked um, with back in the UK, he used, like many other individuals, used um, knives to mug people in King's Cross. King's Cross used to be a nasty area in London to go to. But after a time, he got fed up with this because um, people fought back or they ran away, and it was just not very convenient for him to mug people like that. So he decided to use a brick and would come up behind people and smash them over the back of the head. This is very rare mugging behavior because, as you can imagine, the damage he was doing to other people was so horrific. And in fact, from his own personal point of view, it was bad because whereas there were lots of people mugging other people um, at street corners with knives, there was only one person using a brick and the police went after him with some enthusiasm and caught him very rapidly afterwards. That's the sort of decision-making impairment you see in an individual with psychopathy. Psychopathy is a, um, a clinical disorder characterized by reduced guilt, reduced empathy, massively increased risk for um, 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 aggression, and real problems with recidivism. An individual um, uh, with um, psychopathy is 80% is, um, you know, likely to re-offend within uh, one um, year, and when they've re-offended, they're re-offending for actions of extreme violence. Now, there are two types of major decision-making problems that you see in individuals with psychopathy. The first is this profound problem in empathy. Empathy is critical. You stop doing something nasty to somebody else if you see them distressed, or typically you're much more likely to. You also learn that anything that harms other individuals as part of socialization is something to be avoided, very typically. Individuals with psychopathy shows profound problems in 
uh, showing uh, emotional responses to um, uh, the distress of others. And here's just a study showing um, uh, at the neural level, profoundly reduced amygdala responses to the distress of others, profoundly reduced amygdala responses to fear faces. Very typical response. All of you so greater uh, uh, amygdala responses to more intense fear faces than less intense fear faces. Individuals with psychopathy massively reduced. They don't care about the victims in the same way the healthy individual does. They have the same reaction that you had about stealing the plastic uh, button when considering an action that causes harm, extreme harm to another individual. It's not the only problem with decision making. There are other aspects of decision making that we see problematic in this uh, population based around other regions called the caudate and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. These regions are all massively interconnected with one another. Caudate is very critical for something that's called prediction error signaling, actually responding when something unexpectedly good or unexpectedly bad happens to you so that you really learn that something really unexpectedly good happened, I really should do that thing again, or something unexpectedly bad happened, I really should avoid that thing. Ventral medial prefrontal cortex allows you to represent how good or how bad an action is, if this action is likely to give rise to a good end state or a bad end state. Individuals with psychopathy, profound problems in both prediction error signaling and in representing the value of future actions. So what you imagine here, what we've got is an individual who's showing profoundly reduced distress, reduced um, 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 response to the distress of other individuals, learns very poorly or poor, learns more poorly from unexpectedly good or unexpectedly bad things happening, including the um, uh, um, response of victims. And in addition, whatever the person has learned, they're less able to use the value information as well because of these problems in ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Now, the important thing of what we've got to now, this is work that's really taken place over the last five years, the important thing that we've got to now is we have these neurobiological biomarkers of increased risk for um, instrumental aggression. Not, it's not that, you know, increased risk for instrumental aggression. And that means we can start evaluating some of the social and genetic variables to see whether those variables have an impact on this architecture. So, for example, we know it's, it's, it appears, at least from animal work, that um, things like uh, a fa some certain types of diet, certain types of failure in enriched environment, alcohol abuse during pregnancy, particularly when coupled with specific um, uh, genetic markers, all of those are involved in the disruption of this circuitry here so that it's less responsive, so that you give rise to an individual who should be, according to the, the neurobiology, at increased risk for instrumental violence. Other types of risk factors like uh, trauma actually have a rather different effect and will be more relevant for the talk immediately after. Similarly, we have data on genetics, clear data indicating that certain um, uh, genes are again also pushing towards a less responsive system. Again, we're not at, at the moment we're not clear whether the, how, to what extent those are implicated in the full-blown syndrome of psychopathy, but that's the, um, the, uh, the, um, the work to be done. And what's really exciting is that by having these biomarkers, we don't have to look at treatments to see whether they actually stop people reoffending or stop people f um, attacking other people over a six-month period. We can see whether they are actually directly impacting on the brain systems that we now know to be a risk factor for the display of instrumental aggression. And therefore, we should be able to help much more efficiently in the future. And I'll end there.